This thing's fantastic. I want one. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, our next speaker today is uh, a former colleague of mine from Airbus Defence and Space, um, based in Stevenage. Um, Matthew Stuttard is head of advanced space concepts for um, Airbus, and uh, he's going to um, explain why we put these things up there at all. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much, Stuart, and uh, hello, everyone. I must say it's an absolute privilege to be in this lecture theatre. Um, when I was a kid, I used to watch the Christmas lectures. They weren't the ones given by Michael Faraday, of course, but um, it's, it, it's such a nice space, isn't it? It's very intimate. So uh, my duty is to talk about what have satellites done for us. And there's quite a lot, actually. But um, I work for Airbus, so you know our products. You've flown on our products occasionally when you go on holiday. But there's something we make that you use far more often than an aeroplane, and that's a satellite. So I'm going to talk about how we use satellites in our daily lives. First of all, though, what is a satellite? It's a smaller body orbiting around a larger body. And the one we all know, of course, is the moon. The moon's very useful for us. It creates tides on Earth. It was used for the basis of early calendars. And it's also inspired an awful lot of love and mush, which is very good for all of us. Uh, so that's what the moon's used for. And um, you can photograph it yourself. I took this picture in my back garden. And uh, you don't need a very fancy camera, just a tripod. So, and Another satellite that we're very familiar with, far more useful, is, of course, the Earth. It's a satellite of the Sun. It's a smaller body orbiting a much larger body, and it's responsible for all life in the universe as far as we know it, unless somebody later today is going to tell us any different. But I'm not talking about artificial satellites today. I'm talking... I'm not talking about natural ones. I'm talking about artificial satellites, man-made satellites, First one made in 1957, just shortly before I was born. And does anybody under the age of 12, or 12 or under, can you tell me what the name of this satellite was? Yes. Sputnik 1. Sputnik 1, exactly right. And Sputnik means satellite. It's Russian for satellite. That's how it's spelled. This is what it sounded like. It had a radio transmitter. Those are aerials sticking out from it. There's no air in space. It wasn't being used for aerodynamics. Those are radio aerials transmitting that signal, which could be heard all around the world by people with fairly simple radios. It could even be seen because it was in a very low Earth orbit. And it shone in the sky. And it fired the imagination of the whole world. Newspapers went crazy. The radios went crazy about this. And it kicked off the space age. And it started the rivalry between Russia, which was uh, then the Soviet Union and the neighboring countries of Russia, against the US, started the space race that led to men on the moon. And Sputnik was conceived by a remarkable man called Sergei. Uh, oh, not that Sergei. This Sergei, Sergei Korolev. And he conceived Sputnik as a polished sphere. He knew it had to be polished, even though it was going into space where it wouldn't be seen up close, because he knew these pictures would go down in history. So he was a man with vision, and he led to this chap being the first man orbiting the planet. Sputnik was not much use. Let's wind forward 60 years. Today, we have satellites around the Earth that are incredibly useful to all of us. And weather satellites are a very fine example. Here is one, Meteosat, which hovers, appears to hover in the sky, 35,000 kilometers above the equator, and it can see a whole Earth disk like that, including Europe. Now, on this Earth disk view, because it's above the equator and we're up far north, can't see much of us, so let's just zoom in to Europe. And here you can see... Uh, 
This is France, nice and sunny. Uh, also in England and Scotland, a bit of cloud over Ireland. And the clouds are different colours in this picture because they're at different heights in the atmosphere. And um, so how does this orbiting satellite manage to take a fixed picture? Well, I'm going to demonstrate how a geostationary satellite orbits the planet. And I've had our engineers in, in Airbus in Stevenage make uh, a special satellite that I'm going to demonstrate here. Very expensive, this was. So this is the sun over here. So here we are. This is now orbiting around me. And I'm the Earth. But I've got to be rotating like the Earth does. So I'm going to rotate. And I'm looking at the satellite, and it's looking at me. I'm feeling rather dizzy, actually. <laughs> oh, so I'll continue the demonstration uh, with uh, an animation. So in this animation, the satellite is on the plane of the equator. Of course, the Earth is tilted on its axis, as you all know. So the satellite is orbiting around the equator and it's looking at a fixed spot on the surface of the Earth because it's at an altitude of 35,786 kilometres and at that exact distance from Earth, the orbital period, the time it takes to, to go around the Earth is just under 24 hours, 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, which is how long it takes the Earth to rotate. So the satellite and the Earth they stay in the same uh, relative position. The satellite, of course, is going incredibly fast, three kilometres a second at that distance. And what does it see from there? Well, if you are a satellite looking at the Earth at that distance, this is what you see, a fixed ball in the sky, the blue dot, it's a grey dot here, and this is a day's pictures taken every 15 minutes, an animation, showing the night coming across, the cloud formations, which are the weather patterns, and there's a funny shadow passing down there. Does anyone know what that is? The moon. The yes? The moon. the moon. Yes, it's an eclipse. So that's what an eclipse looks like if you see it from outside the Earth. It's the shadow of the moon passing across the face of the Earth. Now, if you have only one of those, you can only see one face of the Earth. But if you have three of them, as here, you can see if you're at, uh, on the Greenwich Meridian, your satellite's poised at zero degrees longitude, then you can see Africa and Europe. If you're uh, to the west of that, with this American GOES satellite, you can see North and South America, and the Japanese equivalent, 140 degrees east, can see Australia and, and, and Asia. These are not just for pretty pictures, they also uh, by looking at the movies, uh, you can get computers to analyze how the clouds are moving. Uh, this gives you wind speed at different heights in the atmosphere because the clouds are um, at different heights. It's possible to tell how high they are by measuring their temperature. So you can tell what the speed is at different heights in the atmosphere by tracking the clouds. That data is analyzed automatically, updated every 15 minutes, fed into computer models, which give us our weather forecasts. And weather forecasts, believe it or not, have been improving dramatically over the last decade, a lot to do with these satellites in orbit. Not just ones that are far away, uh, but ones that are in a lower Earth orbit and can take more detailed measurements like this one called Aeolus, which is a, 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 it carries a laser beam that fires down into the atmosphere and measures little scintillations from particles in the atmosphere. It, and from those, in clear sky, it can measure the wind speed very precisely from the ground right the way to the top of the atmosphere in a very thin strip, but very precisely. And in clear sky, not just by tracking clouds, but um, in open air. Now, if that data is fed into weather forecasting models in the future, that will make a massive difference to how good those weather forecasts are. This satellite is going to be launched this year. Here, to give you a, an idea of the scale, we have a, a standard engineer height here uh, that you can compare. It's quite a big satellite, weighs 1.7 tonnes, and uh, um, it, it's got a very large telescope on it to see those little reflections coming up from in, in the atmosphere. Right, that's enough about weather satellites. 
Who's got one of these on their roof? And I don't mean two small boys. <laughs> Who's got a satellite dish on their house? Quite a few hands. Yes, quite a few hands. So some of you are watching satellite TV. Uh, you have to fasten it down very firmly, like you can see there, with lots of rocks. Uh, and that's because it's pointing into the sky at a fixed point in the sky. And it's pointing at one of these a telecommunications satellite, and that's what they look like these days. It's got the solar arrays, all the stuff that Sean was talking about, and it's got these, these dishes up here that are beaming TV signals down over a very large area. And those satellites are used not just for television signals, which is broadcasting, it's a one-way thing, but they can also do communications between people from one point to another. So when you see TV reporters in <coughs> war zones or areas which are completely outside uh, connectivity, or you get around the world's yachts people, they're using this type of satellite to do two-way communications <coughs> from anywhere in the world, almost. Here's a picture of one being built, a geostationary satellite being built, and this gives you a rough idea of how big they are. Again, we've got a, a, a British standard engineer in here to give you uh, a, a, an impression of how large this satellite is. And um, just for those of you who may be worried, we do have a quality check where we make sure the engineer's been removed from the satellite before we actually launch it. <laughs> OK, so let's move on to satellite navigation. And if you've got a, a smartphone in your pocket, you have a space-connected device. It's using space all the time when you're using the map function because it's got a GPS receiver inside it. You may have one in a car. You may have one in a smart camera so that you can geotag your photos when you go on holiday. And it's not just for us ordinary folks. It's for vessels at sea. No, one, no longer does the captain of the ship have to use a chart and, and a sextant and a, and a very accurate clock to work out where he is because he's got all of that on the bridge of his ship along with electronic <laughs> chart to stop the ship bumping into things, even in foggy weather. That, you know, they know from the chart where the wrecks are, where the coast is, and so forth. And other applications. You may not know this, but if you travel on a train, you'd think they know where they are because they're going along tracks. But when they're in the station, there's a safety feature on tr some trains these days. The doors will not open unless it's at the station. And so that's a kind of safety feature which is GPS controlled, or, or rather, I should say, sat nav controlled. I'll explain why later. Then surveyors doing very accurate surveys of bridges with laser theodolites and that sort of thing. They're getting millimetre accuracy, again, using satellite technology. Not the same sort of receiver as you have in your phone, something that gives you far more accurate um, um, positioning, uh, but it's still using satellite navigation. Then the other part of it is that SatNav is all based around very accurate clocks and timing these days. And because we've got these super accurate clocks in space, that means we can distribute time accurately all around the world to nanoseconds. Why is that important? Well, if you upload your files onto a, onto a cloud server, you are benefiting from that because that cloud server synchronizes all the files around the world through different servers, and they all have to have exactly the same time tick. And they use SatNav technology to ensure that you know, Google and the like, they use all their servers are synchronized using SatNav technology. Also, all banking transactions around the world, you know, share dealing, high frequency share dealing, all of that these days is dependent upon satellite technology, billions and billions of pounds and dollars of transactions. So it's very important. How does it work? Well, if you're where that red dot is and you've got three satellites in space, Satellite A, the red one, if you know how far you are from it, then you know you're on that red circle somewhere. If you also know how far you are from B and C, you've got an accurate position, okay? Because where those circles intersect, you know your distance from those satellites, that's where you are. It's a bit more complicated than that in space because the satellites are up in space orbiting, so you're not measuring where you are on the circumference of a circle, you're measuring on a sphere. 
And you're not measuring distance with a ruler, you're using a time signal, and the time it takes from, for the signal to get from the satellite to you, that measures your distance very precisely from one satellite. You need four satellites, in fact, to get an accurate measurement. And um, it, the reason for that is to account for errors that are, are, are due to the atmosphere interfering with the radio signals. And uh, with those four satellites, that is enough to give you a position. But of course, those satellites are orbiting in a constellation. So they're not hanging in the sky over your head all the time. We'll come back to that in a moment. So there are three operational satellite constellations today. GPS is the well-known one, the American one. Galileo, operational last year, the European one. Uh, and GLONASS, which is the Russian one. So there are lots of these constellations. Why? Well, it's important to have independence on this positioning. It's becoming so economically important that if one country decides to, or block, decides to switch that off, it's really going to affect the economy. So this is why there are several independent satellite constellations. It's a political reason, really. So how do these constellations work? Well, here's a typical one. It turns out that the, the sweet spot to be is 20,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth. And in that orbit, it's not geostationary, those satellites are orbiting the Earth once every 12 hours, about four kilometres a second, but they're not hanging over a single point all the time. So this is a bit difficult to, to see, but there's one orbital plane here that's got eight satellites in it, another pink orbital plane that's got eight in, and then a blue one with eight in it. Now, there's, there's me on the Earth here spinning round, and I have to have at least four satellites above the horizon to get a fix. So that's what these lines mean. These are the fixes. And as you can see, it's having to switch from one satellite to another. And that's what your sat-nav does. Sometimes you might find that it says, I can't get a signal. It's waiting to get enough satellites to be able to get an accurate fix. So that's how it works, uh, very briefly. You need 24 satellites, sort of minimum. <coughs> OK, so that's positioning. That's where I am. What if you want to track something? That is, you want to know where it is as it's moving around. So it's got to send its position information to you. And this links us into the Internet of Things that move. You might know the Internet of Things, because the Internet of Things is, you know, when when you've got uh, uh, your electricity bill and you're being billed by the electricity meter measurement being sent automatically to your power company. That's one very simple example of the Internet of Things. Now, hopefully your house isn't moving around. It's fixed. So, you know, you don't need to know where it is. And it's on a fixed terrestrial network, a, a, a ground network. It doesn't need space to do it. But if things are moving around, then you need... Uh, a space system, if they're out in the ocean, if they're uh, uh, in deserts, if they're flying through the air. There are lots of examples here, and I'm just going to give you two, just two. Uh, the, the aircraft, um, the Malaysian Airlines flight that disappeared off radar screens, and nobody knows where it is. If that had had a, a tracking device like this on it, we would have known where it was. Now, it needs to be completely independent of the cabin, so it can't be switched off. It needs to have an independent power source, so it's not reliant on the power from the engine, so a, a battery-powered device. And the other one I want to talk about is up here. This is the picture from the guy last week who drifted out. He was the surfer, 13 miles out at sea, took 30 hours to find him with multiple helicopters. If he'd had a little tracking device, there would have been no news. He'd have been found within minutes, and they'd have only needed one helicopter to find him. So this is the sort of thing that the future Internet of Things in space will be able to do. There are lots of applications that are happening now with the Internet of Things, for example, in tracking things with logistics, tracking valuable objects. But the common point is that these devices on things have to be small, light, they're battery powered and they need an aerial which isn't fancy. It doesn't have to point at a particular part of the sky. It's an omnidirectional aerial. So in order to get that kind of feature working, you need satellites which are in a low Earth orbit so that 
um, they can receive faint radio signals from a small uh, antenna powered by a, a not very powerful one and a half volt battery. So in order to do that, you need to bring the satellites close to the surface of the Earth. And here's an example of, of a constellation. These little butterfly wings are not the satellite. These are the beams of the radio receiver on the satellite. And in this constellation, at 700 kilometers, uh, it takes about an hour and a half for each satellite to orbit the Earth. And they're traveling really fast because they're nearer to Earth. The gravity is faster. Uh, sorry, heavier, <laughs> stronger. So uh, uh, you saw Nigel's equations earlier, I'm sure. So this means that the, the satellites are orbiting faster, seven kilometers a second. So in this constellation, if you were here, oh, there, I've got a contact. You have to wait till those little butterfly wings come over where you are. Oh, yes, I've got a contact. I can send my data. Oh, I've got a contact. I can send my data. So you're waiting maybe 10 minutes in this constellation to get a contact with the satellite so you can send your data. And here's an, an example uh, with a whale. Uh, now, uh, whales aren't usually connected to the terrestrial network, <coughs> but they're out in oceans. So here we have a whale that has got a tracking device that's been very humanely attached to it uh, with a spear gun. Uh, <coughs> and that tracking device can... Uh, can uh, measure what the whale's doing. So when it dives into the ocean, it's got pressure sensors. It can tell how deep the whale has dived, and it logs that data. Then when it comes up and to breathe, if there's a contact with the satellite, a packet of that data can be sent to the passing satellite. And then that satellite stores that packet of data in its memory, and it moves along until it can transmit that data back to a satellite Earth station, because of course you don't have satellite Earth stations out in the ocean. And then that data goes into the radio access network, and that is connected to the cloud internet. So that data goes on the cloud, and then scientists can see where the whale has been and what's been up to and how deep it has dived. So that's how you get whales into the cloud. Finally, what's next? Well, this is a future constellation of over 700 satellites that will give global broadband internet access, high speed. Now, I, knew, I have trouble getting broadband internet access on the train coming up here this morning, um, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. Uh, so we have that problem here, but it's also in the oceans, in developing countries all around the world. Many, many people are not only not able to communicate um, uh, by phone, but wouldn't it be great if they were connected to everything that all the benefits that the internet creates for us? That would be a wealth booster for the whole world. It would be very economically enabling if people who are currently not connected to the internet were able to do so and participate in the benefits that it brings. Of course, it brings disbenefits as well, but in the, the benefits far outweigh the disbenefits. So that's the idea of this constellation. Also, uh, if you're in a plane, you won't have to switch, you know, be disconnected anymore. So there can be some guy on that 10-hour flight on the phone all the time next to you. That would be really good, won't it? <laughs> yeah, OK. They'll have quiet zones, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, joking apart. So these satellites, about 150 kilograms, uh, lots of them in 30 orbital planes. This is called OneWeb. It's not science fiction. These are being built now, knocking them out at three a week in a new robotic factory, because normally we put them together by hand. Robot satellites aren't made by robots at the moment. They're made almost entirely by humans, by very precise handcrafted work. And engineers who haven't been to university but have come up through an apprenticeship route are doing that manual work. These are being made a lot by robots. And 800 of them will be put into orbit starting next year, 2018. Lots of launches. So in summary, artificial satellites allow us to communicate instantly by voice, internet, television, know where we are, share time stamps. Sounds really boring, sharing stamps. Mm, stamp club. No, 
timestamps are really, really valuable things for us to use and forecast the weather more accurately, track important things, and see what is happening on Earth. Uh, now, Andrew is going to give us a image-tastic talk about that in a minute, so I haven't really talked much about that part of it. The important point is this is anywhere around the world. It's not just here when you can pick up a phone or you have a mobile connection to, to uh, the mobile network. It's anywhere around the world. And there's one other thing that I haven't mentioned, which is this, the science bit. And uh, planet-tastic John Zarnack is going to talk to us about this at the end of the day. So questions in a moment. But first of all, I have one for you. Who's used satellites today? Yes, exactly. So for most of us in the space business, it's not about aliens, it's not about astronauts, it's not about asteroids, it's about bringing the benefits of space to everyone on Earth. Space is about making things better here on Earth rather than all of those other things, although the other things are very exciting. So any questions? I wouldn't, yeah. I was wondering, we've been having this question about um, back up to Elon Musk's four thousand satellites you want to launch. Yes, well, Elon Musk is saying that he wants to do this, but OneWeb are somewhat ahead, as far as we know, unless he's being very secretive and has already got 2,000 in a hangar somewhere we don't know about. But um, the OneWeb uh, is, is, a, is a constellation that has been proposed by a guy called Greg Weiler, who did work with Elon Musk for a while, and they had some disagreements about exactly what the technical specification of the constellation should be. And... Um, uh, Greg Weil is a very practical guy, and he doesn't have intersatellite links. He has what's called a bent pipe constellation. It's very simple in order just to get it up there. I believe that there was a technical differences between, between the parties, and there is uh, possibly a Google, Google OneWeb, uh, sorry, a Google um, SpaceX uh, mission, but if that's happening, they're keeping it incredibly quiet. Yeah. There's another one there. Yep. <coughs> Following on from that, which country or countries are actually creating OneWeb and who's going to have ultimate control and operation of it? Uh, well, <laughs> funnily enough, OneWeb is licensed in the UK. The licensing authority for launching the OneWeb satellites is the United Kingdom. The satellites are actually um, designed by uh, Airbus and the prototype uh, production line is in Toulouse, uh, but the, the um, the full production line is in Florida. Uh, so it, it, it's funded by a very large number of backers. There's billions of going into this. And there's a, there's a very long list of companies that are involved in it. Coca-Cola, interestingly, are also involved in this because what one way will do is it won't give you a signal right to your phone from space. It will have a kind of uh, a cell which is about this kind of size and needs power. And Coca-Cola are the best distributor on Earth. They, you can get a cold Coke anywhere in the world. So their idea is that they'll have these kind of bubbles on their distribution points, and people will then be able to connect their phone. There'll be a 3G, 4G enabled and satellite enabled bubble that people will then be able to make calls to anywhere, get higher bandwidth and so forth. So that's, that's part of the idea. Can we just yep. take one more at the moment so that we stay on schedule? This gentleman's had his hand up for yeah. a while. Um, just, just one downside to all these satellites. I'm, I'm an astronomer. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. You've no idea what's frustrating when you're looking through the telescope and constantly see these satellites going across. Is yes. there any way you can make them dark? <laughs> <laughs> make them transparent. Well, uh, that comes back to thermal engineering, actually. We do want them to be shiny uh, for thermal management. Uh, you, you need to, um, to very carefully control the temperature, and that involves thermal blankets, which unfortunately are shiny. Yeah, um, uh, we've made solar orbiter dark, but you won't be interested in that because you won't be able to see it. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, I think we're probably going to have to move on now so that we stay on schedule, but Matthew's around, so if you do have any further questions, please write them in a bit later. <laughs>